Friends, my sermon this morning is called, You Can Do Hard Things, in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you like to have a seat? I've been blessed all my adult life to be around elementary schools. My wife, Lori, taught first grade. My daughter, Kelly, there teaches fifth grade. My youngest daughter is about to graduate with a degree in special education. So I've had a front row seat for all the latest trends in education, from the tyranny and pressure of the standardized tests to the inadequate compensation to the abuse that our teachers often take from parents and even politicians. I've been around teachers all my life and I got a news flash for you. Are you ready? One of you is ready. Teachers are not your enemy. One of the many things I appreciate about, about teachers is their desire to instill virtue in children, not just academic knowledge. Especially in elementary schools, you'll see signs in the hallway that say things like, be kind, be a friend, and you can do hard things. In the best classrooms, children are challenged with an ideal both morally and academically. And they are encouraged to meet that ideal. That life can be hard is to be expected, is what they learn. And the teachers want to instill perseverance and patience in them as they grow and achieve. That sounds good to me. How about you? I've been, I've been a little discouraged lately. I'm discouraged by the lack of manners in speech and social discourse in society and the people around me. It seems like we have normalized brashness. We have accepted harshness. We have stopped expecting and looking for kindness. This week I was having an incredibly busy day and needed to grab lunch at a drive through I know, I'm sorry. The place I went to was fast food but it was anything but fast. The line was building behind me, and once I got to the little speaker to order, you know, the <laughs> that, that speaker, it was like a long three minutes before anyone even spoke to me from the speaker. The young lady, once she started speaking, immediately apologized for the wait and explained that they were short-staffed and declared that she was ready take my order. It was in that moment, my friends, that I had a decision. Would I act like an American elementary school student, or would I act like an American adult? An American adult might have said something like, hey, it's about time you got to me. Don't you realize how long I've been sitting here waiting for this? I got things to do. An American elementary student is more likely to have chosen kindness. I went that way. So instead I said, oh, no worries. Gosh, I bet you're having a hard day today. Thanks for getting to me. And you should, you could just hear the relief and appreciation in her voice as I ordered. She was happy to have had a kind encounter. Friends, it's okay to be frustrated. It's normal to be stressed and late it's easy to take that frustration on people like the poor drive through attendant, as if she is the person that caused the place to be short-staffed. It is harder to pause, to put your frustration and anger aside, and choose instead to be kind. You can do hard things. That's my discouragement, that in so many times and places, particularly amongst Christians, the children are the grown-ups and the grown-ups are the children. Just because you have an emotion, an urge or a desire, does not mean that you have to act on it. This is the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount this morning. You might have been able to feel the tension in the room, right, as Ali read it. Jesus' teaching on anger, lust, divorce, and swearing. 
It's tense because it's hard, and it's tense because in our brokenness, we fall short of this. And I'm going to take these topics on with you quickly here, but first, let's fly up a little higher and view this text from above. Would you take it out and look at it with me? It's on page 7 here in your bulletin. It'll help you to have it in front of you. Look with me at Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, and then 27, and then 31, and then 33. 21, 27, 31, and 33. Do you notice the similarities in these verses? Jesus is saying, you have heard it said this, but I say to you this. <clears throat> He's saying here that the law of Moses, the rules, say this, but I'm telling you a higher, deeper, harder thing. Jesus is telling us in this teaching that the kingdom of God is different than the world. He's telling us that his is a better, more difficult way, and that his grace and help and power will be there to help us if we choose to follow it. He's saying that not only what we believe matters, but how we live matters. He's challenging us with this holy thought, you can do hard things. So let's look at these four things quickly. First, anger. Look at verses 21 to 26 with me. Jesus said, you have heard it said, do not murder. I am telling you, control your anger. This is a good word. So I only insulted the drive through worker. I didn't murder her. <laughs> you know, that dear young lady, she probably didn't remember me when she went home that night after her shift. But what do you bet if I'd chosen to be really, really terrible to her? She would have made a tape of that and replayed it when she went to bed that night. Your anger, listen to me, not the person next to you or that you know, I'm talking about you. Your anger and the way that you express your anger, it hurts people, especially the people that are closest to you. They don't deserve it, many of them. And Jesus is saying here, you, yes, you need to get control of your anger. I watched a Facebook video of a woman who decided to feed a baby goat after the baby's mother died. And that's how some of you are with your anger, with your grudges. You take them in, you wrap them up, you get them nice and comfortable, and you make them a nice bottle and you just nurse them. Nurse that grudge, nurse that anger, keeping that grudge alive and fed with your hostility, imagination, and self-righteousness. I've done it too. So you're in the right place with me today. Attaching motives and words to actions that were said. The person you're mad at, you know what? They're not even thinking about you, but there you are, ruminating on them. Jesus, look at this text. Jesus incredibly puts reconciliation above worship. See that? Did you know it was a three days walk from Galilee where he was preaching this to Jerusalem? But Jesus says, if you are angry with a sister or a brother, leave your lamb at the altar, get to step in three days and walk yourself back home, make up, walk the three days back, and then present your offering, he says. Did you know this is why we exchange the peace before taking up the offering every Sunday? The exchange of the peace is not there for you to greet the people that you like the most. It's there for you to seek out that person that you're holding a grudge against, that broken relationship. You know who they are and to say, you know what? Hey, peace be with you. And the other person says, and also with you. Some of you are like, over my dead body. <laughs> I know, I understand. Look, it's always easier to hold a grudge. But catch what Jesus is saying here. If you know enough to know that there's brokenness, then you are to be the one to make the effort at reconciliation. 
Look at the perils of not doing this. Verse 25. Your anger can lead to someone else having to step in and sort things out. Your anger can put you in a literal or more likely metaphorical jail. Trapped in misunderstanding and bitterness with no end in sight. Next, in advance of Valentine's Day, let's have a quick word on lust. Notice, gentlemen, that Jesus is directing this teaching at us. Now, why would that be? You have heard it said, don't commit adultery. I, I am saying, don't look at a woman with lust. Listen to me. Women are not to be looked upon as sexual objects. For example, we very successfully hosted a discernment forum for the three candidates for bishop uh, back on January 29th. During and after the forum, I was in the parish hall. I heard all the conversations that were happening after the meeting. I've heard all the conversations that have happened since the meeting, as looking up to this, this election coming up on Saturday. Do you know what not one person talked about, about the three guys that were up here? What they were wearing. Did you take a look at his shoes? Mm -mm -mm. The nerve. That shirt was a little tight on him, didn't you think? Never heard it. Now, if there had been a woman up there, I'm suggesting that rather than focusing on blouses, maybe we need to focus on our own eyes and our own hands. That's what Jesus is saying. Like leaving your sheep and walking six days, Jesus, of course, isn't literally commanding amputations in verse 27. But what is he saying? You can do hard things. Get yourself together. Next, divorce. Jesus says, it has been said that a man can give a woman a certificate of divorce, but I tell you, don't get divorced at all unless there is adultery. What damage and hurt the church down through the years has imposed on people from this teaching. Let's look at it carefully. Back in those days, it was easy for a man to divorce a woman. It could be for any reason, really. I didn't like the stew that night. And for a woman to be divorced meant that she would be, she would lose her personal and financial security. A man didn't lose an inheritance or property, but a woman would lose everything. And Jesus is saying clearly here, fellas, stop doing that. Jesus is in favor of marriage, yes? He wants us to go into it with the intent of making it a lasting relationship. He's saying to do the hard thing. Do the work in your marriage to keep it healthy and good. Don't run away. You have to try. This is what he's saying. But look at verses 31 and 32 very carefully with me. Let us notice here what Jesus does not say. He does not say, if you work hard in your marriage and your partner doesn't, too bad you are stuck. Jesus does not say, if your spouse is abusive, you mustn't leave, even if it is for your sake and the sake of your children. Jesus doesn't say that. Check what else Jesus does not say. That if you've been divorced, you are to be estranged from the church and not receive communion. I don't see those words anywhere in that text, do you? I'll leave it to the churches that preach and teach that nonsense to defend it. But here, we are inclusive and kind. Here, we understand that no one goes into a marriage wanting or expecting it to end. And when it does, the God I serve draws near to you, not away from you. The church is here for you and does not reject you. Listen to your heart. You know what I'm telling you here is true. Almost done. Lastly, swearing. You know who you are. <laughs> Jesus says... You have heard it said, do not swear falsely. I'm saying, don't swear at all. This is a beautiful thought to close with. Why would we swear? That restaurant was slow, I swear. We swear because we don't think the person we are speaking to will believe us. Why? Because people are not always honest.
But in the kingdom of God, there will be no need to swear because there is only, only, always ever going to be the truth that's spoken there. So be like that, Jesus says, like it will be in the kingdom. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let's make our lives like the kingdom now, my friends. We don't have to wait to do this. We can do hard things, control our anger, control our lust, extend grace in our relationships, and be people of integrity. May these words from Jesus to you today be inspirational, not shaming. May it bring encouragement, not judgment. He knows we have fallen and we will fall again. And he is calling us onward, forward in our lives, in health and peace, and as saints walking together on this fallen earth. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.